Hi, my name is Stephanie, and today I want to talk to you about autism and catatonia, otherwise called autistic catatonia. This is actually kind of a more specific thing. Not too long ago, I did a video on selective mutism, and a lot of people who initially have thought they have selective mutism were describing things that didn't actually fit with the criteria and examples of what uh, selective mutism actually is. And so I had looked into some stuff briefly, and it sounded like catatonia might actually be more representative of what people were describing, but I wanted to look into it more. I've come across some things that I, I find very important, and I believe that you'll be interested in as well. And if you didn't notice, yes, my setup is a bit different than normal. I'm actually holding my mic as well. Um, a lot of different things have happened. You guys are setting on a whole interesting setup. Basically, my house is still uh, being renovated, messed with, whatever, and a lot of my stuff is in a storage uh, thing, and yeah, it's just not fun. So I apologize if there's a bit of an echo in here. This is the best that I have for you guys, so if you want videos, this is how we have to go about it. My apologies. So let's start with what catatonia even actually is. According to Very Well Mind, catatonia is a psychomotor disorder that affects both speech and behavior functions. It can manifest as a state of stupor and unresponsiveness or as restlessness, agitation, and confusion. There are three main forms of catatonia, those being akinetic, hyperkinetic, and malignant catatonia. Akinetic is the most common type of catatonia that features a lack of movement, staring, and non-responsive behavior. Hyperkinetic is the excited type of catatonia that involves impulsive movement. And the third one is malignant. This causes the most severe symptoms and can lead to other health problems, and in some instances, it can result in death. Now, before anyone freaks out, it is not exactly normal for people to have malignant catatonia. So don't freak out if you're starting to see signs of a type of catatonia. That doesn't mean that it's malignant and you're going to have to go to the hospital and you're going to die or something like that. So in general, catatonia affects motor functions in many ways. And this is very relevant to what we have been talking about because speech is one of those functions that catatonia can affect. However, it is important to understand that catatonia is not considered to be common, even though it is most likely quite underreported. According to an article by European Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, catatonia has been found to occur in 12 to 20 percent of individuals with autism spectrum disorders in four international studies. So while not common, it's not necessarily rare either. So to expand on the malignant form of catatonia, this is going to affect the autonomic system, which controls automatic things that go on in your body without your conscious effort. Things like your breathing and your heart rate and stuff like that, that is controlled by your autonomic system. So if that gets affected by catatonia and that effect being malignant, obviously very dangerous things could happen. Now, there have been cases where there was suddenly an onset of slower movements and then this inability to eat and then the heart rate dropping, etc., breathing slowing, all these things happening and people have been rushed to the hospital to find out that it was malignant catatonia. So catatonia actually used to be considered a part of schizophrenia and only recently has been added to the DSM-5 as its own kind of descriptor or specifier diagnosis to be attached with things like autism, depression, schizophrenia, of course, and others. For catatonia to be diagnosed according to the DSM-5, three of the following symptoms must be present. Catalepsy, waxy flexibility, stupor, agitation, mutism, negativism, posturing, mannerisms, stereotypy, grimacing, echolalia, and echopraxia. Now, some of those words I was not readily <laughs> understanding, and so I figured you all might be a bit confused by as well. So I went to go look at kind of what some of these words meant, and I came across a very helpful source. The University College London site hosted this information about what these words mean. So stupor is a state of reduced responsiveness, catalepsy, is where a patient will adopt positions that they are put in by the examiner. Waxy flexibility is only light resistance to being repositioned. 
Uh, mutism, of course, being minimal or absent speech. Negativism is automatic and motiveless resistance to instructions. Posturing is spontaneous adoption of positions that are held for an abnormal length of time. Mannerisms are exaggerated examples of normal actions. Stereotypies are repetitive, non-goal-directed movements. This is also considered stimming. Psychomotor agitation, increased activity unrelated to external stimuli. Grimacing, abnormally fixed facial expression. Echolalia, repetition of another person's speech and echopraxia, the mimicry of another person's movements. You might recognize quite a few of these as typically occurring with autism. However, having autism doesn't mean you automatically have catatonia. So researchers saw this problem, right, of the overlap of common autistic traits with catatonic symptoms. And so they kind of went into trying to find a way to assess possible catatonia specifically in autism, and they broke down autistic catatonia symptoms as the following. Freezing, very still like a statue, difficulty initiating actions, stuckness, akinesia, problems stopping once started, difficulty initiating movement, slowness in movement, requires prompts to complete actions, waxy flexibility, repetitive body movements, stiff posturing, noticeable resting tremor, increased motor tics, waving or shaking extremities, twisting or flicking hands in front of eyes, moving in a jerky way, impulsive, excitable phases, withdrawal from physical contact, spontaneous crying, laughing, or screaming, episodes of aggression, difficulty passing through doorways, difficulty crossing lines on the floor, reduced enjoyment in preferred activities, requiring more engagement to engage, unusual gait or posture, reduced communication, muteness, incontinence, sleep problems, reduced eating, eye rolling or unusual eye movements, unusual facial expressions or grimaces, ignoring instructions, refusal to bathe or change clothes, occasional groans or unusual noises, staring into space slash fixed gaze, and unable to lift head. Now, some of these things are just stims that autistic people do normally anyway. However, if it's abnormal to that person, then it's definitely something to start looking at. The following I'm going to list are included in the symptom list, but they're actually left out of a new questionnaire that was constructed to be able to try to assess for catatonia in autistic people, called the Attenuated Behavior Questionnaire. Now, these were excluded because they were considered to be a very common feature of autism or maybe just reported once. It might have been speculative or vague. So for those reasons, they were left out of the list for determining if an autistic person might have catatonia. These were echolalia, finger tapping, diaphoresis, which is sweating, withdrawal, auditory hallucinations, auditory hypersensitivity, depressed, and anxious. Then they determined six core symptoms, which are the following. Freezing very still like a statue, difficulty initiating actions, stuckness, or akinesia, problem stopping actions once started, difficulty initiating movement, slowness in movement, and requires prompts to complete actions. In the discussion part of the study, they proposed that three or more of those six core attenuated behaviors would need to be present to be considered diagnosable. They also noted that their findings supported autistic catatonia as a continuum and that it may be quite under-identified. Now, this information actually supports something that Maureen Benny posted about autistic catatonia. She shares about this unique gradual onset that is commonly seen in autistic people and something we were kind of talking about with the slower breakdown of speech and certain motor functions as a day might go on if we're under a lot of stress, etc., and we start literally losing the ability to speak or we start to go mute. Thus, why so many people were talking about it maybe being selective mutism. He says that this is quite different compared to the more well-known full-blown stupor state that clinicians are familiar with and obviously that it's easier to spot. Included with that are episodic difficulties or intermittent shutdowns, which of course are even more elusive to be able to diagnose or even know what they are. Now below in the references, I'm going to include an article hosted on Neuroclastic written by the user Consent Squad, where they talk about their personal experience 
with chronic catatonia as an autistic person. I think it's quite interesting to be able to see what that might look like in day-to-day -day things for some people, and it can give you a lot of insight of also what might help if you're seeing the same things that this person is describing. I think many of their insights are clearly backed by the research and information that we have gone over already, and some of it is, of course, anecdotal because they're sharing their own personal experiences and I can't speak personally to being able to check every single one to see if that's, you know, backed by a study or something. But of course, the ability to share our own personal experiences is extremely powerful, especially when these are things people are just now starting to understand, but we have been living with. Of course, as it seems to always be with the autism world, some people try to use behaviorism to get autistic people to comply their way out of catatonia, and this is a gross misunderstanding of how catatonia even works. And even though it clearly is not an answer to catatonia, people still try to use things like ABA to force them out of these catatonic behaviors. This actually led to quite an interesting paper that someone went over regarding autistic catatonia and the inclusion of self-injurious behaviors, or SIBs. This is by far one of the biggest concerns for many people who advocate for things like restraint, seclusion, and ABA. They are worried that these people who aren't really as readily treatable when it comes to self-injurious behaviors, they're worried that they're going to hurt themselves. There are people who have had serious, aggressive, self-injurious behavior that have landed them in the hospital multiple times, and this study even goes over many of those. So many people say, well, we have to have ABA, or we have to have restraint, or we have to have these things for people like this. And I think that this paper is extremely important to that particular issue because it basically says you might be wrong because you might actually be looking at catatonia in autistic people. Now, many of the patients that were looked at for this particular paper had been through countless therapies, many including behaviorist approaches. They specifically mention functional behavior assessments, which while not completely unique to ABA, are very commonly used in ABA. So if you're hearing about an FBA or a functional behavior assessment, it, typically, we're talking about the realm of behaviorism and ABA therapy. While the scope of the paper doesn't go into every one particular therapies beforehand or like how in-depth they were, the paper does note the following. A commonality amongst all patients was a global lack of response despite months to years of such evaluations and therapies. So months to years of trying to use behaviorism and other therapies to get these autistic people to stop injuring themselves or stop doing these catatonic type behaviors that we see in autistic people, they aren't working. This is not effective. This is something we went over a little bit in the major ABA video that I did, how ABA is not capable of handling SIBs and is not appropriate, yet is one of the main arguments that people use for the necessity of ABA. The researcher behind this paper was specifically interested in a few things, and that included how many of the autistic individuals who showed classic catatonia symptoms also showed self-injurious behaviors. Of the 22 gone over in the study, 20 of them did. That means 90.9% .9 of the people studied for this particular paper had classic catatonic symptoms and self-injurious behaviors. Also, these people were diagnosed with autism as children, of course, subjected to countless therapies, had catatonic symptoms, and SIBs. The author of the paper argues for the inclusion of SIBs as a clear symptom of catatonia. Now, from what I understand, they are not alone in looking into self-injurious behavior as a specific symptom for catatonia, and I believe this is quite remarkable information. The concept that people who are suffering from serious, aggressive, self-injurious behavior where nothing has helped them, not even like actually humane <laughs> measures have helped them, that there's actually probably a very reasonable solution because it's actually catatonia is amazing to me. Many of the patients who were showing very extreme aggressive SIBs like constantly were 
directed to ECT, which is electroconvulsive therapy. Now, note that this is not the same thing as the electric skin shocks that they do at JRC. This is something where the brain is stimulated while the person is under anesthesia. They feel no pain, and it is a way to help people who have catatonia. This is one of those more last resorts, but if someone is coming in, there is one person who did over 100 SIBs. I don't know if it was an hour or a day. It was intense, a lot. They were able to bring it down way, way far. There were some who had so many SIBs and then were functioning completely fine after treatment and needed that consistent treatment because it was catatonia, not necessarily just autism. So I do want to make that clear. I'm not advocating in any way for the things that they do at JRC. That is a painful shock intended to punish behavior. ECT is something that is a medical treatment done under anesthesia. The person does not feel any pain and it is to help them in extreme cases where nothing else has helped and is often one of the ways to treat catatonia that has gotten out of hand or might be malignant. Now, all of this information does make me wonder if what we call shutdowns are actually catatonic episodes, especially because some people in shutdown go so far as not moving for hours, and I would say that is a very classic symptom of catatonia. And I also do wonder if catatonia plays a role in autistic burnout. Of course, autistic burnout does have symptoms that are a little bit outside of the scope of what autistic catatonia is, but they both might see that skill regression and the loss of speech and loss of certain abilities and perhaps that specific part might actually be autistic catatonia or catatonic episodes. Something to note as well is that those who were showing more catatonic or more severe catatonic symptoms often also had depression. So me personally, I have experienced many of the catatonic symptoms here, they were really scary and I didn't know what was going on. And I do believe it was mostly triggered by depression. I have experienced chronic depression my entire life, thus the word chronic, and I began to get into a place where I was way in over my head and so my coping skills as an autistic person were just... <laughs> completely crumbling and then I have this depression on top of it and I believe that kind of triggered catatonia for me. Thankfully, I have not experienced this kind of catatonic episodes and uh, times, uh, maybe symptoms that I did when I was depressed since I have been seeking treatment and receiving treatment. I would commonly have issues where I thought maybe, like maybe, <laughs> it would be falling under things like initiation. So you might have noticed that some of the things they mentioned were like not being able to start certain things or not being able to stop certain things. And you might think, oh, that's inhibition and initiation, executive function skills. And maybe, maybe catatonia is actually messing with those skills. But to the extent where I would be at the top of the stairs and I would start crying because I couldn't go down the stairs. I, there was no reason why I couldn't go down the stairs. It wasn't because I was scared of the stairs. It wasn't, there was no reason. I just couldn't go down the stairs. And it would really upset me. I would spin in circles and try and try, Stephanie, you need to go down the stairs. I need you to go down the stairs. Stephanie, I need you to go down the stairs. And at the bottom of those stairs were doors and I needed to go past them to leave to my car. And again, Stephanie, I need you to just leave. Just push the door open. You didn't even have to twist it. Just push it open. It's one of those with a push bar. Just push it open. Just push open the door. You can do this. Like, I need you to leave. And I would have so much trouble with this. And it was scary. Uh, on top of all of those types of thoughts that come along with depression and things like that, I was experiencing just this inability to do certain things. Um, and I thought that was interesting that they were talking about being able to like cross lines or doorways because that was kind of what I was experiencing too. Like I couldn't, I couldn't get out the door and I didn't know why. And it would take a lot. Sometimes I could talk myself through it, but it took a while. I might be spinning for a while. Then it would get to finally I'm near my car and I don't want to get in my car and 
Maybe this was partially because I didn't like my life situation at the time, I don't know. I would find myself having this really hard time with the process of just getting into my car and leaving. And once I got in the car, it was fine usually, but like trying to get into the car, um, opening the door and, and putting my stuff in, I could do that sometimes and be fine, but like then it would kind of start to morph into elopement uh, where I would start to wander and like it would concern people like <laughs> this isn't normal behavior and um, I didn't talk to many people about it because I knew that was weird and I was like wow like is this is this is this the ugly part of autism um, and maybe you know maybe it was partially that but I believe that it was catatonia exacerbating that for me. Learning about this has really been eye-opening for me, so a lot of people are probably experiencing that slow loss of physical skills, speech ability, etc. as a type of autistic catatonia. Anyway, I set out to look into the possibility that catatonia might be what is happening for autistic people who mislabel it as selective mutism and came out finding that it's possible that there are uh, better solutions for some people who experience severe SIBs in autism. And yeah, so it's been interesting. I hope that you've enjoyed this journey with me. I hope that this was informative and helpful for you. Of course, go ahead and feel free to check out the references, check out things like that. Again, if there are sources or places that suggest behaviorism or ABA, I don't endorse that particular answer and really the studies don't either. <laughs> They're finding that you can put someone who has catatonia under behaviorism all day long, it's not going to do anything. So that's really not an answer. But either way, I hope you found this informative and interesting and hopefully it has been helpful to you. If it has been or if you like this video in any way, go ahead and hit that like button and let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Have you experienced this? Were you aware of this? Did you know all about this already or is your mind like slightly blown like mine is? <laughs> Just let me know all of that in the comment section. If you're interested in autism related content from me, I try to upload to this channel every Thursday at 4 p.m. Central Standard Time. So go ahead and hit that subscribe button. I do, however, try to go live with you instead on the last Thursday of the month. Thank you to everyone who supports me here on YouTube as YouTube channel members, those who give through Ko-fi, my patrons on Patreon, and a special thank you to my spaz tier patron, Philip Noah. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you have a wonderful week and I will see you in my next video. Bye.